Welcome! I'm Yuan Nielsen. And I'm Lincoln Murphy. And this is Impact Weekly. We're here to help you make your customers successful. Each week, we answer your most pressing customer success management questions by relying on our years of experience with companies around the world. Let's get this going. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's time for another Impact Weekly. We have a new question and uh, let's get into it. This one is about partners. So the question goes like this. I'm setting up our partner success. What would you say is different and what is similar to normal customer success? And do you have any recommendations for me? Yeah, great one, I think. Uh, Not talked about all that often, uh, but I think I see at least that it's becoming more and more common that companies have several different channels or strategies for their their customers. Some are direct, some are through partners. So I think it's a really interesting topic to talk about and uh, dive into a little bit, especially how to think about it and what, what to look out for and what's different uh, from how you work in, in a normal customer success uh, way, basically. Oh, for sure. I, I just want to echo what you said. I mean, this is definitely something that comes up a lot, and it, but it's not talked about very much. So I'm pretty excited to cover this topic today. Yeah. I think also what I see more and more as well is that you have, it's also because there's a lot more platforms, a lot more products, uh, and a lot more business models now that you see um, vendors that you have customers with different layers. Uh, so it could be almost like you have you have partners uh, within a customer as well. So I think even though you don't have a partner success or you have partners per se, I think uh, a lot of this applies in uh, for a lot of companies anyways, um, how to deal with these uh, intermediates uh, when you're used to working with two direct customers or uh, direct, directly with the end customer, basically, or end user. Totally. I think... This is this is definitely an area where the thing, you know, like what people call uh, their partners or just you know, all the different terms, resellers, distributors, uh, ecosystem, whatever, you know, like there's a lot of different terms out there. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we're not going to be able to solve for all of that today. But I think basically what we're talking about here is just any third party intermediary that sits between you and the end customer. I mean, I think that's that's essentially what we're talking about. And I, I think off the bat there, I mean, what what's the, I mean, what's the first difference we we notice here? I mean, if you have an intermediary, uh, what what's the difference working with that compared to uh, directly with the with the customer? It kind of depends on the setup of yeah the partnership. Um, there are situations where um, some partners don't want you as the vendor to have any relationship with the end customer. They want yeah. to own it. And there are other situations where the partner kind of brings you and the end customer together. So um, hmm. they're, they're there, but they're working with both you, the vendor and the end customer. And so, you know, there's, there's visibility um, throughout the entire thing versus the, the partner that doesn't want you to have any, uh, any role um, in the customer's oh. world, except I guess to you know provide the product or service. So that right there is going to dictate how you approach this operationally. You know, mm. do you have visibility into what's going on? Um, are you going to be able to empower the end customer directly, or are you going to have to create processes and systems and enablement and ops to sort of empower your partner to customer success the end customer so it really depends on that setup yeah for sure but also we we should probably talk about why if you if you don't have partners or you don't have that type of setup today why why are why do why do some some vendors go with a partner strategy what what is the value here of of working with partners and, and i mean if you're naive here, you could say, why Why sh- should anyone do that rather than going directly, working directly with your customer? So 
it's a very, I mean, it's a valid question. And um, especially nowadays where, I mean, the idea of going directly to the source uh, for just about anything, um, mm -hmm. you know, make like that's, of course, that's what you would do. Except I would say, you know, how many people still buy from Amazon? You know, yeah, you, you could go to the source, but you go to Amazon because, oh, yeah. you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the the buying process is easy. They have all your mm. information, um, whatever. So we, we could go to the source, um, but yeah. we tend to still go through these intermediaries that make the entire process easier. So I exactly. think there's a couple of things, though, that, that we need to understand is, and the Amazon example is actually valid, um, even mm. in the B2B setting. There are some industries, some companies, some, uh, I mean, just some companies that have a buying appropriate experience, an appropriate buying experience that is to go to a, you know, one-stop shop, go to a distributor, uh, go to a value-added reseller and just buy everything from them. Yeah. Like they don't want 17 different relationships with vendors. They want one relationship with one vendor who can do everything for them. Mm. Now, I, I don't know, you know, if, if overall in the world that is starting to diminish. Uh, I would suspect that in some industries that is still very much in place and is not going anywhere. Mm. But, but so from, from one side, it's, it's the, the buyer that wants that experience they don't want to have to go to the vendor yeah you know and from the vendor side the idea yeah that there are people out there people companies out there that have your audience yes as their customer mm -hmm. uh it is very compelling like yeah. if all i have to do is build one relationship with one company and get yeah. access to you know, hundreds of of their customers or thousands of their customers like that's fantastic so okay. the draw of that is also very compelling. The other Definitely. thing is, if I have a horizontal product, like you know, just mm. a product that can be used by any anybody in any industry, yeah. I might look for partners that can apply their domain knowledge, oh yeah, to my horizontal product, and then get me into these very specific niche industries where I probably couldn't get into otherwise. Like if somebody mm. in one of those industries saw the potential in my product they might bring me in but you know i'm not going to be able to just reach out into that that particular niche and you know in any meaningful way have them take take my offer mm. there needs to be somebody that can translate what my product does into that that domain into that industry into that vertical or whatever so there's yeah. there's that as well so there's lots of different yeah. reasons it could be a distribution thing for me to get into new to new audiences it could be because my audience needs to buy this way um yeah. it could be a nice mix of both of those things or or other things altogether so yeah yeah lots of different moving parts and I, I think that's i think there are i think you make some really good arguments there but i i also want to pick pick up on that what i call sometimes these partners uh strategies are a mirage as well like uh we we, we paint a pretty picture here uh, we if we just sign up these partners, they will do all the work for us. They will start bringing in the customers, so we can sit back and relax. I mean, <laughs> if I if I if I exaggerate, I think I think we I, I, I'm I've I've received that advice so many times. Yeah, you should do a you should add some partners. You should have partners selling for you, uh, and so on. And I I believe or I've tried it several times uh, uh, and with very poor results as well. So. I think that's why this topic is quite interesting as well, that it's, there is, of course, huge, I mean, I, we know, all of us know several really successful companies doing partner strategies, but I think it's also important to, um, to bring up this part of it as well, that a lot of these things do not go uh, full, I mean, w yes, basically evaporates. It doesn't have, nothing happens. I've signed several partner agreements that, basically brought in zero new customers and and didn't pay off at all uh, so so I think it's important to before you go into this uh, to re also realize where you are in as a company do you have the resources to invest in this and do you have the time and energy and so on and also what we will cover later what we call partner success potential as well I think it's really important part uh, of this 
that's a really, really valid point. And I think some, you know, some, I think it's really good to talk about that, even though, and what we're going to get into some specifics here in terms of partner success, but I think it's really good to have an understanding of it to the extent that we've explained it. Um, there's, you know, obviously it's a, it's a complex um, setup and depending upon, you know, how it actually plays out in your reality, but mm -hmm. um, it's good to talk about this and it's good to even talk about that. Like what would be the motivation for a company to do this? It might literally be, I think other people can sell my product better than I could, or, or they can do mm. it instead of me, mm. that, that type of sort of outsourcing of the sales process that just usually doesn't work. And, and, and anyway, so that's, I appreciate you bringing it up because I think that's something that, you know, overall this stuff doesn't get talked about very much. That certainly doesn't get talked about very much. Um, no. Anything you see on it is exactly the advice you got. Oh, you, you know, you should definitely sell through, through partners. So, yeah. okay, cool. Explain to me exactly how that's going to happen and, and, you know, find partners that are more motivated to sell than, than we are. Yeah. Mm, okay. So that's maybe yes. not, maybe, maybe not going to work. So I think yeah. under, you know, having that higher level perspective. Okay. So why yes. would people want a partner? Why would you go through this? Why would you go this route? All of that stuff is very interesting, but. Let's say we now have partners. Yes. <laughs> so for whatever reason, however we got here, we now have partners. And we've already established what that looks like could be very different from one company to another. Right. So, right. You know, and, and it's hard to even, I can't, I don't know that there's any empirical evidence out there to, 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 to support one way or the other. Like, um, you know, how many how many vendors have a direct relationship with their end customer versus those vendors that don't that only yeah. have a relationship with the partner? I don't even know. I don't even think we can sort of normalize here and have it be something that's going to work for a majority of people. I just don't know what the distribution of, of that is. Um, so we really have to take that into consideration when we're going to talk about these things. But I think if we can just all agree that... Yeah. We're basically just dealing with an intermediary here, and uh, we're not. Even if we do have visibility into what our, was going on with our customer, we're not necessarily going to have a direct impact on the customer success. We're going to have to rely on the partner. Right. Let's use that as sort of the backdrop for what exactly. we're going to talk about here. I think that I think that should cover most of the bases. Yes, I think so too. And and let's let's go back to the question here as well. So so this person now, as you say, we we have partners already. Never mind how we got there and or the reason behind there. Uh, and now I'm responsible now for make customer successing my partners, basically. So so that's where we are at right now. And and let's talk about how that's both different and similar to uh, how we how we do customer success in or, uh, in general. Well, and I think the best place to start is what you brought up a minute ago, which is partner success potential. Yes. So this is something we're going to have to deal with once they are a partner. It's certainly something we should have been dealing with before they even became our partner. But let's talk about that for a little. Yeah. And I think uh, and as, as with our customers as well, they evolve, right? So similar with partners, maybe even more so. So uh, I think it's something you need to reassess the partner success potential as you go as well. But I think just it's it's very important to understand. Uh, I mean, what is the motivation for the partner here to work, help us with our our end users? How how dedicated are they? Are we one in many of their offerings, uh, or are we just the sole one that the only one they work with? I think, I mean, this is of course something you 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 know, and and but but this is I, has quite big impact on what what you can expect from the partner as well. Uh, so I think that's a big dimension or a big part of the dimension when you when you look at partner success potential, basically. How dedicated are they? Um, and, and also what I like to talk about, how, how, how well is the overlap between what the, what the partner wants to achieve and what we want to achieve, or uh, even more so the customer, our, our, our joint customer, what, what, is, what, what are they trying to achieve? Or do we have the same goal, basically? Just like in customer success, just straight up customer success where, where we are working with the end customer. 
that alignment has to be there. We, we have to understand what the customers try to achieve. We have to make sure that what we're doing is, is in line with helping them achieve that. And now you add mm. this extra layer in there. That alignment has to be there throughout the entire sort of value chain. Um, mm. And, and it, it, this, is, this is complex stuff. You know, think on the, on the partner success potential thing, just like with customers and, and success potential for our customers. Yeah. Meaning, can we check all the boxes that, that indicate that a customer has the potential to be successful with us? That it's not success guaranteed. This is just sort of a minimum viable customer, right? Right. If, if these things are in line, that means that they have potential to be successful. This is not an ideal customer. An ideal customer would have more, more th- boxes to check. This is just, yes, they have the potential to be successful. The same thing we need to do with, with our, that we do with our customers, we need to do with our partners. So I would say if you have partners that you're working with right now, go back and look at those and say, um, what would be criteria for, for a successful partner? And how many of our customer, how many of our partners um, match that criteria? And, and those that don't, we would say that they're a bad fit partner. So mm-hmm. using the example that you were talking about, Yon, if we need our partner to be 100% dedicated to our product, because our product is very complex, our customers are very complex, their customers are very complex. Um, and yet we are just sort of a part of a portfolio of products that they offer to their customers. That might not be enough. And, and, and so we need to be realistic about that. This is not a kind of partner that is going to be able to be successful working with their customers, working with our product. Like it's just not right. going to, it's not going to work. So we need to be realis- realistic about it. But there's going to be other criteria that is unique to your situation that you're going to have to come up with to say, if I can, if I can check the box on this, then our partner has the potential to be successful. If I can't check that box, then they are not going to be successful. They are a bad fit partner, and we should probably do our best to stop working with them because our end customers are not going to be successful, and we're not going to be successful in in supporting them and empowering them to make the end customer successful. Um, a real concrete example of that is, let's assume that the end customer or the end users needs a certain amount of training. Yeah. And our partner does not have the resources to be able to provide that training. Hmm. In this relationship, the partner wants to own all customer-facing activities. So they, they won't allow them to come to training with us. Well, they need to train the end customer. They don't have the resources. They're unwilling to, to let the customer come to us. That would be a bad fit partner. Right. So we need to be realistic about that stuff. So obviously doing that before they become a partner is best, but doing that right mm. now and going exactly. back and saying, all right, well, here is a list of our bad fit partners, which probably, by the way, also jibes with the results that the partner is getting or, or that you're getting with that partner. Um, and then you can manage accordingly, right? So it's just like we would do with our existing customers. So that's really important stuff. I don't want to gloss over how important the partner success potential is no i think that's um i think that's uh it is a little bit more complex when you have a partner basically uh because you have to manage two 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 sides uh, or two uh, counterparts here you have the partner and you have your end customer which is is of course your customer your recurring revenue uh in the end so you need to make sure i mean uh, that the the when the partner's success is equal to your end customer success, basically. And this is where I think the success potential uh, is is, uh, is a work you have to do constantly with uh, as you go. And of course, have that when you start signing up new partners to make sure you get the right ones in. Um, let's let's also talk a little bit about um, how how do we how do we do with communication here? I think that's also something that's uh, given the complexity, you also have to think on com- communication. Uh, we, uh, as you say, there's several setups here, so we, we, we kind of need to 
look at the the one we uh, discussed earlier. So I always say we want to make sure that we're we're enabling our partners to do more of their core business to to you know do what is necessary for them to be successful. We want to empower mm-hmm. that. Um, and you know, so again, whatever this is going to look like, but in terms of communication, we and, and so, so going back to what you were talking about earlier about sort of the mirage of, mm. of partners, we rely on them for sales, right? So, so right. we look at them as, a, you know, and sometimes they are a distribution partner, but mm. we really look at them as, as somebody that's going to bring in, you know, new customers. Yeah. Well, we also do the same when it comes to customer success. We, we say, gosh, now we have the, we have all these different companies out there representing us and, and, you know, they're selling stuff and they can also be doing customer success. Hmm. So we're basically trying to offload or outsource customer success to these companies that, um, you know, again, you have to look at your success potential there, but you know, they, they may be working with 12 different vendors or hmm. 200 vendors or whatever. And like, we're expecting them to, to do everything for us. It's not right. going to happen. Even in the best scenario, you want to rely as little on other people um, uh, as you can. So what yeah. I mean by that is uh, even if they have the resources and they have the, um, the desire to, to do customer success sort of on your behalf as the vendor you know, with, with their customer, you don't want to leave that up to chance. So to the extent mm-hmm. possible, you want to create the playbooks and the processes mm. and, and write the emails or you know, come up with the templates or, or, or come yeah. up with talking points and scripts and whatever else, the same thing you would do for your CSMs, we want to do for them. Right. So we're not leaving it all up to them. We're not leaving it up to chance. It's, it's actually, I mean, if you go a step further, it's not really fair to say, okay, um, go make the customer successful and then give them no direction. Right. How would you like that, right? We know that that doesn't work very well when, when we're working directly with the customer and it's certainly not going to work well in a scenario where they're having to try to make the customer successful using a product that's not even their product. Exactly. So that, you know, from a communication standpoint, again, to whatever extent possible, we need to have this stuff be somewhat generic so they can brand it with their own, uh, mm. you know, and they can, they can do everything on, on, on their end to, to, keep us out of the loop fine yeah but we still need to provide that and i think if if you understand that and you can start building that enablement uh for the partner i think that's going to be uh your your best your best bet and your best way forward here yeah no i i I think that's a huge point uh so it's it's similar to what we have in with customers we build a, a customer success plan we need to have a partner success plan and I, I would say also that this can differ between partners as well and, and goes back a little bit to these uh, partner success uh, potentials as well. If you identify these are the um, the missing parts uh, or, or these are the things this partner can deliver on and these are the parts like training that we, 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 we don't see this partner being able to do that, then we should insist on us having that part uh, in the relationship or that should be part of the success plan uh, together with the partner as well. And this can vary. I've seen this. Some partners can do more and some can do less. So we, we should not also just throw out the partner. <laughs> we, we need to revise a little bit as well, uh, usually, uh, because they have different, they are different animals as well, the partners. So, right. So, I mean, I think this goes to, to success potential, just like we say with customers. Like if we're doing customer success potential, this is a moment in time where we say right now, here is what we can do for our customers. And so customers that don't match this criteria right now, they don't have success potential right now. They would be a bad fit. Right. So let's say we're an early stage startup. You know, Mm. we don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of resources. We don't, you know, we we can't help our customers in in the ways that we would maybe like to. So customers that need a lot of strategic guidance, need a lot of technical setup, a lot of stuff. We can't do that for them. Later on, when we grow, we get some funding, We get, you know, we just evolve, we become more mature. We can start doing more things for our customers. We now have more customers that we could identify as as having success potential. Same thing goes for your partners. 
if right mm. now you cannot do a lot of enablement for them, you, mm. you can't do certain things or the relationship that you have with your partners maybe is still based in a legacy of distrust in your industry. Like, you know, I've, I've run into that situation where companies mm. come in and they're like, you know, uh, this XYZ company that everybody knows, you know, they used to sort of try to pierce the veil of the partnership and go steal in customers from their partners. So mm. now everybody that does business through a, through a channel partner doesn't trust their partners. Um, right. Like if that's what you're dealing with, okay, that's the reality right now. But maybe as we work with our partners and we build that trust and we, you know, some of those, that, that legacy baggage starts to fall to the wayside, maybe what we can do for the customer, maybe we can have a more direct relationship with, with the end customer. Now, if that happens, then, then the, the nature of our relationship with the, with the partner is going to change. So, yeah. you know, over time, what success potential looks like for a partner would just naturally evolve. So, you know, all of that stuff has to be taken into consideration. And I think that's, that's really yeah. big, but you do have to understand what you can and can't do right now. Mm. And that will tell you right now, whether some partners have success potential or not. I agree. I think that's sometimes, especially if you, what I mentioned earlier as well, if, I mean, be, be aware that, Usually, partner a partner strategy requires quite a lot uh, enablement to make it successful, and uh, be aware that you have that those resources and you have that maturity in the company before you launch. I think it's a yeah, it's, it's a big point here. But great, so let's let's uh, break this down into our three concrete things. Uh, so this question was basically: I'm setting up a partner success. Uh, what what? Uh, what are the differences and similarities to normal customer success and what are our recommendations? So our three things, uh, let me start here. So we talked about it a lot, uh, but I want to make sure, put together a partner success potential checklist, basically. That's number one. And number two is develop a partner success plan, just like we would do with our customers. What's it going to take for our partner and our end customer yeah. to be successful? Put that together. And number three, keep up with the evolving goal of the partner. And you need to make sure that that's in line with the end customer uh, goal as well. So uh, those are the three things. Uh, good luck with this. And keep asking questions to us. And see you all soon. Hey, thanks for listening. Do you want to bring your customer success to the next level? Check out Impact Academy. We have training programs for customer success managers and for leaders in customer success.